Welcome, everyone. I'm James Shore, and this is the Art of Agile Development Book Club. Today's book club is about pairing and mobbing, and we have two fantastic guests joining us today. We have Woody Zool and Chris Lucian. Uh, Woody Zool is an agile and lean software development guide who has been programming computers for almost 40 years. He is an originator and pioneer of the mob programming approach to teamwork in software development and a founder of the No Estimates discussion. Woody, welcome. Oh, thank you. And it's an honor Chris, to be here. Oh, yeah. I'm so happy to have you here. And Chris Lucian is the director of software development at Hunter Industries, a founder of mob programming, co-host of the Mob Mentality Show, and international keynote speaker. He's passionate about the advancement of software craftsmanship and machine learning. Chris, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to get things started by reading an excerpt from uh, The Art of Agile Development. A key idea, collective ownership. Agile teams share responsibility for results. The whole team works together to get stories done and each with each team member fluidly taking on the work they know best, assisting people who need help, and learning how to contribute to work they don't yet know well. If something goes wrong, the team works together to solve the problem. If something goes well, the team takes credit as a whole. Some teams assign stories to individual team members to work on independently, but the best Agile teams swarm their stories. They tackle one story at a time or as close to one at a time as they can manage, coordinating and collaborating so that everything comes together. By doing so, they avoid the risk of one person getting stuck in derailing progress without the rest of the team knowing. On delivering teams, this co shared ownership extends to code too. And collective, the collective code ownership practice describes how it works. And of course, pairing and mobbing are a big part of that. And that is our topic, our topic today. Uh, you can find excerpts uh, describing how they work uh, on my website. They're currently up at jamesshore.com slash S slash AOAD2. That stands for Art of Agile Development 2. And you can buy the book in both ebook and print formats. Our first discussion prompt uh, is about, uh, of course, pairing and mobbing. Now, as I mentioned, they are based on this underlying appreciation of collective code ownership, uh, the idea that it's good and desirable for the whole team to be responsible for all of its code. So this question is for everybody, but I'll start out with Woody and Chris. Uh, how have you seen people respond to this idea and how have you helped them accept it? Uh, Woody or Chris, would you like to, to respond to that? Well, you know, right off the bat, uh, collective code ownership is really critical. Uh, I remember a quote from, from Kent Beck many years ago saying, uh, Every bit of code we have should look as if the same really tremendous programmer wrote that code. And it's hard to get that when people are you know, feeling they individually own this area. I have worked on code where somebody wouldn't let you work on the code that they were, you know, was their uh, baby, so to speak. And I think that allows things to stagnate. More ideas, more minds on it gives us more ideas. And that collective ownership really allows us to work when somebody's on vacation, when somebody is uh, you know, not available for whatever reason. And as the people who wrote the code progress in their career, they may not be writing it anymore and they need to leave somebody with the ability to work on that code. So I, I like the idea in, in every way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the point about uh, being able to go on vacation, I think is is such an under overlooked one in that, yeah. I've, I've met so many programmers who are stressed out all the time and they, you know, holding really tight to their code, but also feeling like they couldn't ever leave their desk, metaphorically speaking. And um, those two things are connected. Uh, again, we would love to hear from all of you. If you'd like to, uh, this is a call-in show. Uh, we want to hear your voice. So just raise your hand and uh, I will call on you. Uh, Chris, what's your experience with this collective code ownership idea? Yeah. Um... <clears throat> So uh, a, a while back, I think that a lot of people that I've run into mostly accept it, but um, I have worked with a few that when we started mobbing, they kind of said, well, I, I don't feel the ownership of, of the, uh, the code that I work on. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so that got me thinking about the difference between the code, code ownership and, and, and ownership, you know, personal satisfaction with, with the team versus personal satisfaction with creating uh, a code. And so I, I wrote this uh, blog a little while back and kind of explaining that 
those those really satisfying personal contributions can come from contributing to how well the team works uh, by contributing well in retrospectives and contributing well uh, from kind of a feedback perspective and, and radical candor and all of that. Um, and so, you know, I find that you can increase that that say you can get that same feeling at the same uh, at the same time while mobbing if if you feel that it's lacking, but but feel uh, that way about improving and working on your code on on your team and your team work uh, because the team owns the the code together, and so that, that's kind of been a, a little bit of an interesting um, side note to that. But uh, I feel that most people that I run into. Um, haven't felt like that, but there there have been a, uh, a few that um, that I've to- spoken to in that way. You know, of course, uh, Hunter Industries is is known for mob programming, so I imagine the people you hire know know what they're getting into uh, coming into it. Have you had anybody there who who was surprised about mob programming after or during the interview process or or after uh, after hiring? Yeah, we, we've uh, we've definitely tried to make it very clear that we're mobbing, and, and even though interview is mobbed, and uh, it, including the idea that um, when we now bring in a candidate, we show them a time lapse of our day. We have you know a number of other things, and so it's really important to us to, to make sure that uh, that the candidate knows beforehand uh, that uh, they're mobbing because. It, it was shocking at, at first for a few people before we really explicitly specified that. <laughs> and ha- what happened with those folks? Uh, did they stick around or? Um, well, you know, so, some were were surprised, but but excited about it. But um, you know, we did have a few that that were just uncomfortable and stopped the interview. Then uh, I think just because they weren't expecting it, and so this is why in our in our material leading up to it. Uh, we just we we say you know this is what our day looks like this is what the interview is going to look like uh, et cetera et cetera and and that's been very effective we haven't had an uh, an incident like that since you know for a very long time so it's just been... can I interject I, I yeah. think the interview process regardless is a stressful time for most people sure yes. is, and yeah. the more transparent things are the less you feel in control of the process because you're the one being interviewed. Uh, for you younger folks, I'm going to tell you something that I've taken to heart for years, and that is the interview isn't for them to decide about me, right? It's for me to decide about them. Because As an interviewee. Know, yeah. If you are interviewing me to take a job, I'm there to decide, do I even want to work for you? Mm-hmm. So they're in the hot seat, not me. And I, you know, I think that that's how we kind of have to look at it. But it's stressful for most people to go into interview. I'm not going to say the wrong thing. And the more transparent it is, the more people that are sitting with you, observing you, you're going to feel uncomfortable. So, yeah, in our interview process, we try to make it as comfortable as possible. Yeah. I know well, I work at Hunter, but yeah. I, I think particularly in in the, the current era right now where uh, – seems like there's a lot more demand for for programmers than there is than there is space um you can take advantage of this to to you know go interview and get get practice with it something that's right something my parents did when i was when i was a teenager is they said you have to go get a job every year from like 14 <laughs> every summer you have to you have to go work and um of course as a teenager i wasn't a super super fan of that idea. But I realized later that this made me so comfortable just going through the interview process. And it's really paid off, uh, pay, paid off for me later in life because, you know, some, some interviewers are not super sophisticated, unfortunately. Um, some of them are out more to prove how smart they are than to really understand you. And um, they are going to pick up more on those cues of, you know, yeah. uh, of superficial things like, being nervous than necessarily your strengths. Well, you, to relate that back to the uh, to the code review, I mean to the shared code ownership. Um, if the interview process is it's clear that we're working as a team, that there it's going to be going through your mind is because you're used to being in control of this class or this feature or whatever. You're gonna, it's going to be you know you're going to ha- you're digesting this idea maybe for the first time. Almost every one of us has worked most of our career as solo developers or solo workers somehow. And we only interact in meetings or one-on-ones, but it's way less of the amount of 
the time we have, and most work is not done. The actual work of producing something is not done in a group. So these are uncomfortable things. So collective code ownership in the, in the way that we might think of it in a, a open source project where, you know, anybody can check something out, then you do a pull request and all those, whatever you do. Um, that's maybe as far as we've ever gone with it. But collective code ownership in, in the way we would work on a team, we are all working on that code all the time. So no matter what we work on, everybody's got their fingers in it. And it's not necessarily uncomfortable once you've even tried it one or two days. We've had people join us just to spend a day with us. And by the end of the day, um, you know, to see how this is being done, they were fully immersed in working this way. You go from complete novice to almost expert at collaboration because everyone else around you is focused on helping you feel comfortable on making it easy. They're respectful to you, towards you. They treat you kindly. Uh, they make it fun. Uh, it's engaging because things are working, moving along really quickly. And that really means we're making progress quick, quickly. It's not that we're like, working hard all day. We are, we're working at a sustainable pace all day. So we don't get the, I would say, the fatigue that you yeah. get when you work alone by having your mind yeah. overused all day long. We're sharing that cognitive load. So there's, it's uncomfortable at first, but yeah, collective code ownership, it's new to most people. Yeah. Um, we've got a, a hand raised from Steve. Steve, welcome to the show. Hi, Steve. Unmuting. Um, thank you. Uh, number one, James, thanks for having this. Woody, Chris, fantastic. Long time uh, mobbing pairing um, proponent. Uh, absolutely. Uh, Want to go back. Interviewing once, twice a year is key for your career. Interviewing is a skill you need, and you, when you need it, you don't want to be brushing up on that skill. So I heard that advice many, many years ago, and it's paid Good off point. well. Good point. Um, one thing that I did uh, many years ago, I heard about mob programming, and I was familiar with pair programming. Uh, I thought, oh, mob programming, easy. It's just getting people together and doing it. Um, not uh, Aside from selling it, the act of doing it, I failed miserably at it and I didn't find it very effective. It wasn't until I got Woody to come uh, work with my teams and do some workshops that I really discovered the power of it and how I was working wrong. Is there any advice, uh, Woody, Chris, or even James, uh, or anyone here that could uh, give to others that might be in, in a similar situation where, you know, I tried it once or twice, but wasn't very effective. Well, I think you are somebody who could potentially give some advice. So what, what did you learn when you brought Woody in that you were doing wrong? Uh, to watch some videos of Woody <laughs> <laughs> talking about it. Um, my, my perception of it was, yeah, we just go as a mob and it's a mob using the bad connotation of the word rather than an ensemble uh, mm. to work with it. So There's that used structure. to be a joke. That was a joke. To, when we used the term mob originally, it was when I was doing coding dojos at user groups. I started doing that a lot in 2009. And I would get up in front of the group and say, hey, what we're going to do is kind of a, a dojo means we're going to do something as a group here. We could split up into pairs and have everybody pairing with someone else or whatever. But what I'd like to do is we're going to bring a pair up here. And then every few minutes, we're going to switch that pair. And I want everyone to contribute. And then usually uh, I would say something like, we, it's like a mob programming, but we don't want to be an unruly mob. We want to be a ruly mob. So that was just meant to be a funny joke that nobody ever laughed at. But anyways, uh, and that's where the name came from. But this is how I saw it. When I first started doing these coding dojos with, you know, user group will have 15 or 20 people. It's chaos. And I almost instantly applied a few very strict rules to that chaos. And one was only one person out of all these 20 people is allowed to speak at any one time. And we did it with a timer because we're not working with the people we normally work with. When we're working with people we normally work with, and I'll give an example of Chris, if Chris goes, oh, I think I got an idea. And then I go, oh, I, I think I got a better idea. And we, you know, that would just be nonsense. We hear the first idea. If it's worth trying, we try it. And then we express the second idea. We might put it in the parking lot, you know, write it down and put it up, but we don't need to express it. So this was why mob was mob is because it was kind of a joke. Uh, 
but I think of this way, a mob is a group of people who've gathered together to take action on something they're reluctant to take action on their own. And I like to picture it kind of like, uh, you know, a comical uh, bunch of bubble, bum, bumbling uh, fools running down the street with pitchforks, but uh, that's just the joke of it. So really, and this is what happened for us. One day, somebody came, one of the, actually the lead programmer came to me and said, we're, we're way behind on this thing. We haven't been working on it. Uh, I had been postponing the work. And she said, we got to get started back up on this. So she went to look at the code, came back in a while and said, I want to get some other people looking at it. And we went to a room. Uh, we made a meeting. We went to the room. We started looking at it. And one of the team members immediately said, boy, this code, uh, look at these long methods. Let's just start you know, doing read by refactoring. It wasn't called that then. And in we went. So we had already learned how to keep our mouths shut, how to be willing to try other people's ideas, how to strive to understand instead of strive to be understood. And all those skills are needed. You can't mob program without, without some, I would say, at least a halfway decent protocol of interacting with each other or some pretty good people skills of letting others share their ideas. And to that, I'll shut my mouth. I see a couple hands up. Yeah, it looks like uh, lots of people are, are inspired by this conversation. Yeah. Uh, let's go ahead and start with Jordan. Jordan, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks. <clears throat> I'm just curious real quick um, how you've seen this evolve and um, adapt to our increasingly remote teams. Um, I, you're probably anticipating that question, I'm sure, and you've gotten it lots. Um, but I'm sure as, you know, as, as our company is, we went completely remote with pandemic. Um, it was already a trend in IT and, and software development. So not a new thing, but it forced us to, to, to do that. But it has always added an extra layer of just what would have maybe been natural before. We have to be creative. And so I'm curious what you've seen work well in other situations. So I, I want to just interject something first and allow Chris to, to speak to this, because he's got a bunch of people who've been working remotely and previously weren't really typically ever working remote. Uh, starting way before the pandemic, uh, I was doing remote mob programming. It, it, it's one way to get your team together that uh, is hard to do, you know, when they're living in cities far apart. It works just as well remotely. And in the last two years, it's all I've been able to do. And I've worked with teams of, you know, uh, typically five or six people with 10 or 15 teams across the company. And it just, it works really well. But Chris, I think, could have some really great experiences uh, that they've been experiencing right at Hunter uh, over the yeah. last two years. Um, so, uh, yeah, we were, we were in person. Um, the company was really not thinking about going remote uh, before mm -hmm. March 2020. Um, and so, uh, you know, we, we went remote in a hurry. And so th there were a few things that kind of naturally happened. Um, one was, uh, you know, we had these on-site stations and so workstations and, and they were really powerful computers and they had all our environments already set up. And so, um, tools like team viewer and any desk came in really handy there. We just remoted directly into those machines and then worked the same way we did before. Um, and then, you know, the different, uh, the different like physical, uh, hardware requirements started kind of popping up here and there. But a couple of really cool things happened. Um, so one, uh, you know, during the course of forming, uh, of growing that department, we kind of went from five to uh, 27 people, 30, about 30 people, and it got really noisy. And so um, at some point, we spent quite a bit of money on sound abatement equipment. So, so because you could overhear mobs constantly um, on, on every part of the room. And uh, now all of a sudden, you're kind of just working with your mob. Um, and we, we kind of found like, oh, hey, well, we need that same idea of like walking around the office and just being able to drop into a mob. And fortunately, and I think both Microsoft Teams and Slack have this, but you can actually start a conversation on a channel that anybody can join or leave at any time. And so what we found is we reproduced that, just that walk around feeling by having these channels that were up. You could see who was in them. You could join them if you wanted, and you can sporadically just join and leave mobs whenever you wanted to. So if you had a quick, quick question, you could quote unquote walk around over to that other mob and do that. Um, but uh, I think the the really huge benefit that came to us from uh, from remote mobbing was that um, when we were in our physical space, we had a lot of product owners, product managers that were 
uh, only available some of the time. And that was because they were walking from meeting to meeting, just back and forth. And, and you know, um, it, it was it was unlikely that if they were walking to our firmware engineers that they would come and see us because we were in a different building and it would take additional walking time. And so um, our product of owner availability actually went through the roof because now everybody was expecting a phone call. Everybody was expecting to talk and, and it kind of was equal, equalized that and, and made a, a video call expected. And so um, we went from some product owners being available only monthly to the team to, to daily. Um, and the productivity on those teams went way up. So, so there's, there's some really great benefits to remote that people don't um, necessarily realize, but I think uh, it's been, you know, minus the interpersonal physical interaction, it's been uh, overall a really big benefit. And then one comment I had for the last question, um, if somebody it doesn't have a coach to work with them on a new mob experience, uh, consider the mob programming RPG by Willem Larson. Um, he and I were talking while he, while he was working at Hunter and we were, um, we were just kind of discussing the taxonomy of mobbing and, and how there's like a navigator, but then there's a navigator of a navigator. And we just said, let, you know, let's do some anthropology. Let's find all the roles that are there and then incentivize them in a game. And so the mob programming RPG is a really great way to, uh, self-coach a new mob. Thanks for that, Chris. I want to come back to uh, something you said about uh, having having the the product managers, product owners come in, be available to the team more often. And you saw productivity go way up. Um, can you say a little bit more about what happened there? Like, why did productivity yeah. go up? Well, so it was kind of funny because we had this kind of running experiment. Uh, maybe we were unaware of where. Some of our product owners were available daily. Um, some were available only once a week, and because we had you know multiple teams at this point, we were seven or eight mobs. Um, and then, and then another one was just like really infrequently available. And uh, and so there was a huge queuing time for questions and getting an questions answered. And and it, it was it was actually physically measurable. And so there was a lot of time where I was like, we need this person's time more. And, and, you know, the company's pushing back saying like this person's working on all these firmware and hardware projects as well. And so um, it was really just difficult to, to get those questions answered quickly um, just because of the, the physical space demands. And so, um, so just comparing all the productivity of all these teams, if you if you looked at the value stream of each of those teams, there was it, with the team with the unavailable product owner, we just saw a, a huge delay in answering questions, and it introduced a lot of waiting time into the team. And um, and then almost immediately after going remote, it was like, hey, you know, all of a sudden this person is showing up in our daily standups and. Um, and other things along those lines. And so, and I say daily standups because this is, this team is three mobs. It's like a, a, a fairly large team. Um, but we, we were able to have conversations with that person daily and, um, and in those conversations, you know, things just got answered so much faster than they used to. And then, and then delivery of features, uh, started to happen much faster as well. I, I love that story because one of the biggest mistakes I see mistakes, uh, shortcomings, perhaps I see from, from organizations is that they completely underestimate the need for the product owner or product manager to be part of the team, to have that whole team with collective ownership that includes the product manager and product owner, not just, uh, not just programmers. Yeah. Uh, Eric has had his hand up for quite a while. Eric, thank you for your patience and uh, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, James. Um, so a lot of my questions kind of got answered during that previous exchange. So thank you very much for that. Uh, but I would like to add one kind of twist on it. If you're trying to introduce mobbing into a group that maybe has a sense of collective code ownership, they feel comfortable jumping in on other people's code, jumping in on the code that they own as a team, and they don't, they don't, they don't feel strong, super strong individual ownership, but they're not used to that collaborative style yet. And you're in this remote situation. Um, so the mob programming RPGs, it sounds like a great suggestion to start with. Um, but would you recommend, would you recommend a particular type of problem or, or, or selecting something to frame in order to 
or like a particular types of problem is going to work better than others for that introduction where you're going to get that positive response. Yeah. So, so if I understand you correctly, you're asking uh, if you're introducing mobbing to a, to a team, what's, what's a good place to start or what's a good type of problem to start on? Is that, is that the question? Yeah. Especially given the remote world we're in right now. And yeah. like that, I feel like that introduces other difficulties. What, you might what's have your take sort on of fewer chances. Uh, were you, you asking me, uh, James? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So I've, I think I've now, I kind of tried to calculate the other day done. I know I've done over 500 and maybe up to a thousand uh, workshops. I've helped kick off hundreds and hundreds. So if I've done 500 workshops, there's usually four teams in a workshop. That's a lot of people. And uh, everybody wants to know, well, you know, what should we do for starting? And I say, make it as easy as possible. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd like to give an example like this. Let's say you've been practicing guitar for a while. You think you want to join a band. So you go up to some band that you really like. And you say, hey, I'd like to play guitar with your band. You know, yeah, you're not going to really be able to join them. It takes a long time to get good at playing music with other people. So you have to practice that as well. So not only do we need to practice the skills individually, we need to practice the skills that we need as a team. So if I if I was coaching a group, I and I I have I normally even if they have to work doing mob programming because that's what they set out to do, I set aside time for practicing these skills. So you do that in whatever way you like, but I suggest that we would work on exercises that have nothing to do with work. There's a big problem that happens when we have work that needs to get done. All of a sudden, people are more concerned with getting the work done than in working well with each other. So the skills that we need to develop to work well with each other, I have noticed are better learned by us practicing it. I'll just give you one example. If I get on a bus, let's say I'm traveling through Europe and maybe uh, I've had some really distinct memories of this, say driving across, uh, on a bus across Sweden and somebody sits down and they want to be, and they want to talk. So a lot of people, you don't want to engage people because you know, you, you want to read during the whole thing or whatever. I'll, I'll, I will just allow them to, I think this is serendipity. And then I focus and listen to them like this, whatever they say next will be the most important thing I'll ever hear in my life. If I practice that, I get fatigued pretty fast. But if I practice that for an hour or two every day, I improve my listening skills. So instead of me trying to think of the next thing I'm going to say, I block my brain from thinking about the next thing I'm going to say. Because a big part of what mob programming is about is being ready to accept someone else's idea and run with it. Instead of saying, I think there's a better idea because that will stop us. That blocks us. Everything we're talking about here is about improving flow. This has to do with everything we've said so far, the collective code ownership, uh, working remotely, uh, having the product owner available to answer questions. This is all about flow. I saw something years ago, uh, uh, a problem in software development where uh, we weren't understanding each other very well. And one of the biggest problems is waiting to get an answer to a question that is blocking us. And this, if it takes us even one minute to get that answer, it's wasted time. If you did a value stream map, you know what I mean? Value here, not value down here. If we could compress that out. So this is, this is a big part of this, is if we learn how to interact well with each other, that flow improves. And we learn best by practicing. And we practice best when we're doing something that isn't critical. Imagine if you're going to learn to just, pardon me for being a little too violent. Let's say you wanted to be a boxer. And so you say, hey, I'm going to learn to be a boxer. Uh, just put me in a fight. You know, you're going to get beat up and pretty soon you're not going to want to box anymore. Uh, I was a little kid when uh, they put me in a ring at Boy Scout camp or whatever. And I don't want to get hit in the head by another kid. That's not the way to learn. You have to learn to, what is the fitness we need? What is, uh, do we need to have stamina? Do we need to have quickness? Do we need to practice blocking? There are a lot of things we need to practice before we get, you know, go out there and actually do whatever that sport is. Yeah. So yeah, if you have to do work, I say pick some really simple bug fixes and then try everybody's ideas. Those are contained, they're small, they're clean. Um, and you learn real quick whether you have enough information to do it or not, because that's what usually happens. You get the bug report and it tells you what's wrong. And then when you go into it, you go, wait a second, this isn't what they thought it was. So yeah, you're going to discover that quicker. That's a big and part of mob programming is rapid discovery. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll throw this out there too. Um, 
know, I totally agree with, with all of that. And, and I'll just point out that like when we started mobbing for the first time, everything was more based off of, off of an emergency and like somebody kind of under a lot of stress um, and, and the team coming together and helping them. Uh, and so, you know, I, I have heard of mobs forming around um, some, some piece of work that is stalled or, you know, those sorts of things where it's like, it's born out of necessity rather than, than, you know, um, trained up. And so, you know, if there's some, some sort of sort of urgency around something um, and it's, it's more of an emergency than anything else, I see that kind of like war room thing sort of, sort of start happening and people start passing the keyboard back and forth. And so, um, you know, I, I think getting there gradually is really good. I think there's also this possibility of getting there in, in an emergency and, or a serendipitous event um, as well. But I don't think Chris, you want I to want to interject that. something on you when you, because yeah. you know, what, what I've seen in doing this is uh, I would say almost every time I've given a talk at a conference about mob programming, somebody comes up and says, oh, we've been doing something like that. And when they yeah. explain it to me, it's when they had a big emergency. And I said, well, how did it go? Oh, it was great. We really got a lot done and we got it done quickly. And I said, great. Uh, did you continue working that way? No, we just, we, that was too much pressure. And it was, you know, it's like, okay, yeah. we need to learn how to do this where it is sustainable. Yeah. It, it, when we're doing it under pressure, yeah, you know, we really come together. We work hard. And when we're all done, we want to take a two-week vacation because it was so hard on us. Well, we always want a two-week vacation, but you know what I'm saying? So, uh, so I, I, I don't want to cover that too much more because it looks like Harold's got his hand up and I'd love to hear from Harold. <laughs> well, um, actually, uh, I, I want to build on that for a moment, which is sure, that sure. I, I do see, you know, changing habits is hard and um, it, it's easier to change habits when you've got a really strong motivation. And I do see that a fear of loss or an emergency or something like that can be a really good time to try out changing habits. But as you say, um, I think... Uh, I think sticking with it afterwards is is also a is also a challenge. Yeah. Um, Harold, welcome to the show. Uh, I'm sorry. This has been a hard lesson for me to learn. So when I first <laughs> encountered mob programming, I just want I just thought this is going to save the world, and I kind of still feel it. But it's not about mob programming. I think it's about this artwork yeah. and this sentence from one of Woody's talks, which is. The object isn't to make art, it's to be in that wonderful state which makes art inevitable. And there, there's what I saw with Woody uh, when I started really noticing, because I thought it's this format, it's this amazing format of just uh, rotating and sharing control. And then I, I just noticed Woody always there in all of the videos. And he's just like kind of watching them in the back of his head, typing at his computer while they're, while they're moving around. And, and it's, uh, he, he, I've seen Woody do this work and he can kind of joke and prod people and get them off of, of the, the ego trip and, and, and do it very skillfully. And I, I really want to hear from more people about how to do this uh, and, uh, and make it happen. It seems to me the just, uh, just really appreciate your work, Woody, and I'm glad that so many people are, are getting this. There's something about this concept that it isn't about mob programming. That's right. That's right. I don't think actually the mob programming. Oh, I'm sorry, Harold. I'm just sorry. It was. It's in the RPG in Mobster. If you, you can download it yeah. with that Willem programmed, it yeah. rotates various statements every now and then that you're exposing yeah, yeah. your team to it. And one of them is it isn't about mob programming, which is so zen. Yeah, so zen. Thank you. Uh, that's, uh, that's an important point because mob programming itself is what emerged out of a team that was learning how to work well together. We didn't know that's where we were going to end up. It, it, the problem with almost every agile practice, and I don't think of mob programming as a practice. I just think of it as one of the ideas we need to collaborate. So it's more of a principle. But the problem when things turn into practices, we then think the practice is the value. But the practices and the value, I, I got my training, uh, uh, some of my training from uh, Ken Schwaber. And I remember him in the, uh, in the training saying, uh, if you do things the same way I'm teaching you them a year from now, you didn't learn anything from me. I thought that was, that wasn't the exact words, but it was basically what he said. It's like agile is principles and values. 
and we can fulfill those values with any number of practices. We have to pay a lot of attention. Is this working for us? Can we make it better? And is it so good that, that we're going to do it a lot? Or is it just some, it's part of our bag of tricks we'll pick up every now and then? It's way more important to be in that meta level of that saying you just shared. It's about having an environment where great things will happen. We don't know what those great things are. It's rather than trying to do a great thing, let's create an environment where it's natural for greatness to happen. To, so everybody on the team can excel. Everybody in the company can do their best. Yeah, let's find a way to do that. And I think, Chris, I hope you back me up on this. That's what we were trying to do uh, at Hunter when this emerged. And there were many other good things that emerged as well. Yeah, yeah, this just I happened think, to be one people got interested in. I think that, uh, you know, there were, there were a couple of things that I, I saw in, in the environment that um, you had established, Woody, uh, before I had started there, which was learning sessions and retrospectives. Um, and so it, it's, and, and I, I kind of later started calling that the virtuous loop. And so it's, you know, no matter what your team's doing, um, if you only did retrospectives, then eventually you'll, you'll re reach some asymptotic, like uh, high, high uh, performance that, because you have no new practices coming in. Um, but, and, and then if you're only doing learning sessions, then, then the new practices and new technologies may not never make it into your stack. But but if you're doing the virtuous loop, if you're doing learning sessions and retrospectives, you have new ideas working its way into your into your system, and you have a, a system for replacing or adding or removing um, practices, tools, uh, you know, um, working agreements, and, and so now you, you kind of have this uh, continuous improvement cycle that that ends up happening, and, and so. Um, as long as you can maintain that loop, by, you know, mobbing, pairing, all, you know, all, all the stuff that we do to make our work better can always be replaced by something else later. Um, Absolutely. We are almost out of time, but I have, I have one last question for you. I think I'm going to direct this at, at you, Chris, uh, because you, of course, do work with a lot of teams at Hunter uh, and have a lot of people go through um, and, and, of course, for the long term. I, I often see a worry from people that pairing and mobbing won't work for folks with who are introverted or who have social anxiety. I think this fear is often overstated by people who haven't experienced it. <laughs> but um, what what do you do at Hunter in in your in your mobs uh, to make sure that everyone is feels safe to participate and that it's enjoyable uh, for for everyone? Yeah. Um, so, so we spend quite a bit of time, uh, you know, kind of doing training on radical candor, psychological safety, those sorts of things. Um, we also, you know, people can voice opinions uh, in in retrospectives. Retrospectives are very varying in frequency. Um, we uh, we kind of openly talk about it. I, I would say that there's probably a 50 50 uh, split between introverted, extroverted and in, in, in the group that we have. Um, and you know, a lot of the time, a lot of people that are kind of self-proclaimed introverts, uh, will say things like, oh, well, you know, if I'm working with the same four people for a while, it's like either meeting the new people or having a group larger than that or something along those lines. Um, and, uh, you know, the teams, each mob develops their own working agreements around, around taking breaks and, and other things along those lines. And so, um, you know, people have always kind of been able to find opportunities to recharge. Uh, we, you know, we, we put a really big focus on making sure that um, everyone is is continuing to feel supported. Um, and, and then I guess one thing that we do kind of on a six month cadence is uh, a happiness over time uh, kind of uh, it's, it's a little bit of a blind retrospective. So so everybody goes into one on ones. And then they get a, a kind of a horizontal axis of time from six months ago to today, and then just draw how things have been uh, over time. And then when you talk about the peaks and valleys. And so if, if discomfort with interactions, interpersonal interactions, um, it would show up in that, especially if it's dragging on a lot. Uh, and then we talk about it and then we, we kind of develop strategies together to, um, to kind of dig, dig ourselves out of, out of anything like that. But um, in general, uh, you know, and there's different kind of styles of mobbing that, that I'll, I'll see. Um, so some people, uh, maybe more extroverted, may push really hard um, on 
on a forward path. And then others who, who are more introverted will actually slow things down and just say, hey, let, let's think about this more deliberately. Um, and actually the combination of the two is really good uh, because then you kind of get this like push and pull of, uh, of deliberate evaluation of a forward path uh, versus, and also a kind of a, a sense of urgency around uh, like forward movement. And, um, and those two things together can be really positive. So um, mixing the two has been uh, pretty good uh, as long as there is a mechanism for any one person to not dominate. And then one thing that I do say often, um, and this kind of works its way around is if you have a group of four people mobbing, then you probably should hear each of their voices about 25% of the time. And so it's kind of this equality of vocal representation in a mob is really important too. Absolutely. Uh, you know, that, that diversity of experience and a diversity of perspectives brings so much richness to, uh, to a team's work, which of course is why collective ownership is so valuable and having a whole team is valuable. Unfortunately, that is all the time we have today. Uh, it's been a great discussion. Uh, if you'd like to continue the discussion, because I think there's a lot of interest here, uh, please join the AOAD2 Discord, uh, where we talk about uh, these book club topics uh, throughout the week. Uh, you can find it at jameshore.com slash s slash AOAD2 Discord, and that will take you to an invite link. Uh, Chris, Woody, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having us. Thanks. Thanks, James. Uh, yeah, next week, hands. <laughs> uh, next week, we are going back to the focusing zone with a discussion of user stories. I think more ink has been spilled on user stories than just about any other agile topic. Uh, so it's sure to be an interesting one. And I'm very happy to say that Bill Wake has agreed to join us as our special guest. Uh, Bill, of course, is a longtime ex-peer and Agile Coast coach who is uh, known for the INVEST acronym for user stories. So if you've ever told somebody to use the INVEST acronym uh, in discussion of how to create good stories, well, that's, uh, that's come from Bill Wake, and he'll be joining us next week. Um, I'll be putting up the announcement and free reading uh, soon. So keep an eye on jameshore.com for that. Or again, uh, go join the uh, Discord, the Art of Agile Development Discord, jameshore.com slash s slash AOAD2 Discord. We'll get you in the invite link. That's it for today. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining us and for your participation. Uh, Woody, Chris, thanks again for your participation. And uh, I will see you all next week. <laughs>